Welcome back to another episode of the Traveling Podcast. We're joined today by Mr. Nathan Daly. Round of applause, virtual round of applause. Thank you, thank you. Yes, sir, yes, sir. So you are a returning guest. Yes. Last time we talked about a myriad of things. Right, we, right, we right. meant to talk about police reform, but today we're <laughs> actually going to try to do that. Um, Thanks. But uh, let's start with your story, man. How did you find your way into law enforcement, and uh, how did you find your way out of law enforcement? All right. Um, again, thank you for having me back. So how did I get started, man? I used to work at the hospital and uh, worked in the ER, and I uh, was a, a patient finance tech, I guess you can call it, right? So I would do, handle the money and stuff. So often police would come into the ER all the time with, with, um, with victims, with suspects, and I would take my time and develop like a relationship with the officers, learning their stories. And I just got really, um, really taken by a lot of, a lot of the things that they did, you know, saving lives and protecting lives and things like that. So um, a lot of the people in the officers in the department at the time really got to know me. And so one day, one of the, one of the uh, canine officers was like, hey man, we're, we're looking to recruit some people, man. You have a great personality. People really love you. Um, you're very helpful and things like that. I think you, you have the character and the personality that would make a good officer. And at the time, I was like, nah, I never had any interest in being a, a police officer. I actually was thinking about going into radiology. Like, I like science and things like that. So policing wasn't even on my radar. Um, and I wanted to get into, like, more of a science thing because I just really love science. And so I decided to kind of take a chance at it. I said, let me, let me sign up and see what's up. I'm not with the boot camp military stuff. That's, like, not my thing. I just don't think I'm, I, I'm built that way. And, and it's true, I'm not. Because when I went into the police academy, I applied for uh, DeKalb County at the time, went into the police academy. I had a horrible experience in the first couple months. And then uh, after a while, I started developing a really good relationship with my uh, academy, my academy class. We ended up becoming like brothers and sisters. And um, fast forward, you know, invested a lot of years, obviously worked in different areas and aspects of uh, the police department. And then uh, fast forward, of course, you know, 13 years later, um, after kind of going through all the motions, I found myself as a senior officer doing a, conducting a traffic stop for something very, you know, kind of routine, very simple, um, uh, driving with the cell phone, you know, something real simple, you know, knock out a little ticket. Turned out to be a lot more going on, a lot of drugs, uh, guns, and things of that nature. Um, but either ways, I tried to make an arrest of a suspect. I got caught inside the vehicle, reaching in to grab the suspect, and he drove off down the interstate. Um, because I couldn't free myself in time, I actually had to, I, I felt my legs kind of being dragged by the car. So then my instinctive response was to just kind of jump, jump up and hold on. So I jumped up and held on. As we were going down the, the ramp of the interstate, the suspect started ramming me against oncoming cars as he was passing by uh, intentionally. Um, and then eventually I end up, uh, he ended up hitting me up against a white van. I got thrown off the vehicle um, and uh, almost got ran over. I was unconscious and I don't know for how long. Eventually uh, people had got out of their vehicles to stop traffic, things like that, because they saw me hanging. I mean, they saw me lying on the road. So that accident was th the accident that ended or put a pause, I would say, ended my police career. I was actually... Um, had an application out for the FBI. I was two years into the process. So my goal was to go into the feds and work. And so that also um, interfered with that as well. So I um, had to get multiple surgeries and had to do physical therapy, had to learn how to walk again and things like that. I had so much internal damage um, that I didn't, I didn't know how that recovery process was going to look. So, you know, of course, dealing with that, you're looking at your entire future kind of change. You're not knowing what tomorrow looks like what the recovery looks like. And then as I started to feel a little bit about myself, better about myself going through um, the healing process, getting out of the depression, I had a lot of support from the citizens and the community. People were sending me cards, cookies and gifts and things that, in that nature, you know, and so that, that helped a lot with the recovery. Um, but then COVID happened and then George Floyd happened. And so I spent that time trying to recover, also witnessing the country kind of, in my opinion, was burning down, right? And uh, it was a lot of riots, as you remember, and things like that. Um, and that kind of led me to where I'm doing now, being on YouTube, kind of providing some insight into the profession. Because at that moment, I, was, I felt that I, 
I had something that I could give. I had something that I could provide uh, insight. I wanted to solve the problem. You know, I, I felt confident that I understood the problem well enough based on my experience that I could provide some information to help turn this thing around and really have a, a new criminal justice system or at least a better criminal justice system, um, better policing and a better relationship uh, with the citizens and the police, especially as it relates to the black community. And so that kind of led me into that direction. So talk about the Blue Phoenix, uh, Phoenix Initiative. Um, what, what inspired it and like what is your ultimate goal? So that's a great question. So um, during my recovery, I had a, uh, a lady sent me a gift um, and the gift I received, I was at my lowest, absolute lowest point in my recovery period. I was suffering from depression and um, I was to help with the depression at the time. I would open one card at a time. I had hundreds of cards. So each day I said I'll open one card to kind of give me some inspiration to right, kind of right. move forward. Um, so, so one day I... Uh, People won't recognize it, but my face was cut up really bad. It was swollen really bad. It's that I had melanin, over like, man. Yeah, the melanin <laughs> bounced back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I was spotty, man. My face was, you know, was white. I had white blotches in my face from where I was injured and things like that. The swelling was bad. I almost lost my left eye from the accident. Um, and so I still had the stitches in and uh, stitches in my head, my lip, uh, above my mouth. Uh, around my eye and things like that. And then also I, had, I still had the road rash, burns and things. So one day, uh, one day I wanted a burger. There's this place uh, near where I lived at. It was like the best, they had the best burgers, whatever. So um, went over there to get, a, get something to eat. I still had the bandages around my face and I'm inside there ordering my food and this kid comes up to me and he says, oh, um, I just wanna say uh, uh, thank you for your service. You know, you're you're a hero, you're a superhero. And I'm looking at him like, I'm looking around like, who was he talking to, right? Mind you, I looked like a bum, right? I had this big cast on, on my foot from my leg. And then I had just, I just, I just looked like a bum. And there was no way to distinguish who I actually was. You know, I had my arm in a sling and everything like that. And uh, so I, I looked around and I'm like, huh, excuse me? He said, yeah, he said, uh, you're a superhero. Thank you for your service. And I looked up and I saw the kid's mother. And she was like, hey, hey, I just, uh, we just wanted to say thank you so much. We saw what happened. She was like, we were actually on the interstate. You know, when, when the accident happened, we remember who you are, you know, Officer Daly. And I was like, oh, I said, okay. I said, thank you. You know, I, I really appreciate that. And I told him, I looked down at the kid and I was like, well, why do you, why'd you call me a superhero? I'm no superhero. I said, superheroes don't look like this, you know? And I was in a very low state, you know, like I, I didn't, I didn't feel good, you know, I didn't feel good. I, I wasn't confident. Um, my face was tattered, you know. And so when he was saying that, I couldn't see what this kid was seeing, you know. And I asked him, I said, um, "Why? what do you mean superhero? I said, superheroes don't look like this. And he said to me, he's like, well, you know, only a superhero can get hit by a car and get up and walk again, you know. And when he said that to me, it really struck something on the inside, you know. And I was like, damn, what does he see inside me that I forgot? Right. And, and, and regardless of, of how I looked or how I felt, he saw something great. And it was weird. I got that lesson from a child, right, a young man. And so uh, I said, hey, you know what? I appreciate that. I was like, thank you. Um, you know, I got my food. He got his food. He walked away. And I went back home, went home and cried. You know, I was so, I was so torn inside. I didn't really understand why I was so low, why I felt so bad. I said, but this kid saw something in me. You know, he, he said I was a superhero. So, you know, I took some time out, started to pray and ask God to kind of give me some strength to get me out of this depression that I was in. Yeah. I um, had a box that I haven't opened and the box was sitting across from me. And I was like, man, let me, let me just open all these cars. I'm gonna open all the boxes today. You know, I'm not gonna like use this as like a crutch anymore. And I went to the box, opened the box, and there was a uh, there was a a knitted blanket, handmade, like knitted blanket, um, like crochet, and it had the blue line on it, the police blue line, and the black on the on the opposite ends. And there was a letter in there. It was a lady. She has a nonprofit, and in the letter it wrote, you know, this is a 
uh, this this blanket, let this be a covering for you to, to make you feel safe, to, to give you comfort. And as I was reading her letter, man, I just broke down in tears. And I put the blanket over me and I was just, I allowed it to cover me and kind of give me that, that strength. I felt the love in that. And uh, that in that moment, I told myself, I want to do something for for officers. I want to I want to be able to do and create the same type of experience. You know, I know what it feels like to be in this void, to be empty, to be scared, to feel lonely, to feel regardless of having this this second chance at life, not feeling like it was worth it, you know, Um, and I know what it feels like to suffer in silence. And despite the family and everything, there's still, you still have to get yourself out of that depression, you know? And so I said, I wanna do that. I wanna be a voice for officers. Um, I wanna be a voice to fix this divide, you know? And even, even, even the, um, the reason that got into this, the reason why I was injured in the first place was because I came in contact with someone who, who was afraid of the police, you know? And through his fear, he acted in a way, right? Um, I told myself, I, wanna, I want to bridge that gap. I want to tell the citizens and, and even the black community that like, we can have a relationship where we don't have to fight each other like that. We don't have to risk our lives against each other. Like it's not a war between us. And though, though I might do something wrong or you might do something wrong, we don't have to try to kill each other over it. You know, there's, there's so much that we can just come to the table and have a discussion about. So my mind creating the Blue Phoenix Initiative was to repair that relationship, take the time to have tough conversations, bring both sides to the table, and then also to show officers that they are loved and that they are appreciated, just like someone took the time to show me that I was loved and I was appreciated. And that one act of kindness from that lady saved me from, you know, depression, an extended uh, depression. And I think, you know, um, she's an amazing woman. You know, I reached out to her. Um, she actually, we partner together on my nonprofit. So I always shout her out. She, she her, her nonprofit's called Covering the Blue. And anytime an officer is injured, she always sends out a, a, a blanket out to them on um, the same way she sent to me. And I just real I just remember just how powerful that was, and so the theme of the Blue Phoenix Initiative is to triumph, triumph over tragedy, um, and that's what I feel like I did. I called the Blue Phoenix because I felt like in that moment I had died out there on the interstate, and I I kind of rose from the ashes, you know. And so I wanted an organization that reflected that um, growth, rebuilding, um, and then coming out of something that may have looked impossible. Um, and that is, uh, that's the story. And uh, that's what it's about. It's about um, showing love and, and, and empowering people to, to turn tragedy into triumph. What's your take on the divide that you're describing? What do you think is at the core of our community's distrust of the yeah. police? our community's fear of the police, anger towards the police? How, how would you describe it after being on both sides? Um, I would describe it, there's, there's a couple components. There's, I think, about, I would say, maybe three or four. One is the historical setting, right? Law enforcement always represented a, the, a, a strong arm of white supremacy used to oppress black people. Um, that hasn't been 100% addressed and corrected. Um, I also believe that uh, we have the behaviors of officers over, over the time, history, and even today that don't warrant a trusting relationship. I believe the, the trust in a lot of communities has been broken and damaged. Some people feel uh, that they, they can't be repaired. Um, so, so that's an ongoing battle as well. I feel like we're always trying to catch up to a place Third, I think uh, media, I think uh, the news media, I think inter the entertainment industry, I think the music industry, I think they also help add fuel to the, um, the fire 
they're not putting out anything positive about police. And so what ends up happening, you start, you continue to, to add more um, unhealthy discourse to the conversation. Because now as a, young, as a young man, young woman, you start hearing in the music about how the police can't be trusted. Um, kids are experiencing encounters with the police where their parents are taken away and they're not old enough to understand maybe why. You have officers that, that um, maybe it might be one or two or three, but they abuse their power consistently in a community. And because of that, police, we all share the same image. You know, just kind of like how we talk about being profiled uh, or stereotyped for being black. Well, police are also stereotyped for being blue. And so regardless, the first thing people see is that, that blue uniform. Um, they see that authority. They don't see the individual in that uniform. They see the person who last disrespected them or violated their rights. And now they label all officers under that same, that same umbrella. Um, and so there is a concerted effort that's needed. And I think the onus is on the police profession to fix and rebuild the relationship. Though we do need help and assistance from the, the citizens and even the black, the black community in general, I think it's on the police, it's on us to take that first leap forward and show that we can be trusted. Um, and I think one of the biggest problems is, of course, that racial component, right? Um, we know that racism is, does exist in policing. We also know that there's uh, white supremacy agents in policing that operate um, in that uniform uh, or just in the criminal justice system period. Um, and though that doesn't make up everybody, but we know that there are people who are operating undercover, I guess you would say. Well, that doesn't make black people feel comfortable at all. And, they, and so the question is, okay, well, how do we fix that, right? If we know that granted out of 10, maybe it might be one. Um, well, that's one too many. How do you address that? You have the excessive force. How do you address that? And then you have the lack of accountability. How do you address that? So a lot of the biggest issues or responsibility falls on the profession to fix. You know, the citizen, they have one job, which is really follow the law, right? Um, but the, the officers, um, the police officers in the profession, they have a lot of responsibility. They have more than the citizens. You know, um, they're tasked with making sure they enforce the law um, properly, justly. Um, they're tasked with making sure that they're professional. They're tasked with making sure that they're not biased, without, with they're not racially profiling. They're tasked to make sure that when officers make mistakes, they're held accountable. Um, they're tasked with making sure they have integrity and honor um, and that they are treating everybody with, with, with an equitable level of treatment, whether you're black, white, Asian, or Hispanic. So there's, there's a multiple, uh, multitude of things that uh, the profession is responsible for that they are not doing the best job that the citizens feel like they are doing. And because of that, I think it's on us to fix. Um, and again, the citizens that simply need to just follow the law. And if they don't, it still doesn't mean that they should be mistreated or abused uh, because they are in violation of the law. Um, so that's, that's where I see the issue at. Um, and lastly, I would say professionalism. I think that's probably the, one of the biggest ones. I think one of the <clears throat> one of the critiques of law enforcement is it's not spread out equitably. And what I mean by that is some communities are over police, other communities are under policed. Um, we're searching for crack, but we're not searching for cocaine, right? How would you make that make sense for somebody who hasn't been behind the blue wall as to why the frat houses aren't being rated as much as the houses in the hood? Well, I would say two things. I think sometimes there's, um, people underestimate the power of behavior. Um, people underestimate the power of image. And I think um, people are very observation based. And so what I mean by that is if you're, you're looking at, you're observing a pattern you're observing behavior patterns. You're observing how people operate, and you're also operating off of your own biases, right? This is where the racial profiling comes from. Um, it's either a trained observation over a course period of time, or it's a conditioned 
response, right? You've been conditioned to believe something a certain way, or you've seen a pattern so much, and we call it like a pattern recognition. Like I've seen this thing sound like a duck so many times that now every time I see it, I, I, I think it's a duck, even though it might not be a duck, it might be a quail, right? But the reality is um, there is something true to that, that that can't be ignored as being uh, a problem. Now the issue is um, people say, well, you have white communities that are not over, over police. That's not technically true. What they're talking about is poverty. When you look at poverty and look at certain communities based on poverty, um, those communities are police, and they're also police based off of demand. What a lot of people don't realize is that within our community, within the black community, some of the high-crimed areas, citizens are calling and asking for us to be there. They're demanding it. You know, that's part of the, the, the profession that people on the outside don't see. When I come into work, we get, we'll get stacks of papers and say, hey, in your territory, this area has been having a lot of car break-ins. This area has been having a lot of drug complaints, um, people loitering over here and doing this and doing that. And these things are called in by citizens, it's called in by businesses. And so what, what happens now, I take that paper, I'm responsible for checking these different locations throughout the night. And at the same time, we also know what areas are our problem areas. So when people say, okay, well, there's some black communities that are over police. Yes, that's, that could be true. It's over policed, but a lot of times it's by the recommendation of the people who live in that community. Um, and so that's, you know, people forget that you have crime, you have criminals in a, in a community and they represent a small, very small percentage. Everybody else is there wanting to go about their day to day without any issues. So, but at the same time, that doesn't excuse that you do have officers who will um, saturate certain areas because they believe that they'll have a higher, um, there's a higher probability that they can get drugs, get guns, right? find somebody that's wanted. And, and a lot of those times, those are areas that are, are, um, are black. But what a lot of us don't see is that these same type of tactics also happen within um, low income and poor white communities as well. We don't hear about it, we don't see it from, um, from the black community's perspective because we're not white. And so I think that one of the challenges is, for me, is to always try to make sure we get a very well-rounded view of what policing looks like and not to think that um, the black community is getting such a bad end of the stick in reference to poor policing tactics. People always say, well, uh, you don't see white officers doing that, going into a community and just shooting the kid or doing... I said, yeah, it, it does happen. And the media might not show it to you, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And a lot of our perception of law enforcement as it relates to how we are being treated comes from the media. So the media is only showing you bad outcomes with um, uh, white officers on, on, on a black citizen. Then you're going to assume or you're going to uh, speculate that this is, how, this is how we're being treated by white police. But they never show you when a black officer actually shoots a black citizen, right? That's not something that's pushed through the media. And so it makes you believe that it doesn't happen. They don't show you when a black officer shoots a white citizen. So there's that also that idea that it doesn't happen. And I think that creates um, a sense of uh, deception almost on the media's part because they truly believe, they truly, <laughs> that creates a deception on the media's part. And what ends up happening is people start to believe that that is how it works um, and that's not accurate. Um, but it's not to take away, because I know when I say this, there's nuance to it. So it's, it's not to say that black people are not having uh, negative outcomes or they're not being abused by law enforcement. It's not saying that. Um, what it is saying is that white people are also being abused as well, that the policing problem in this country isn't unique just to us. The policing problem is an American problem. And the moment we understand that, we fight it together, we fight the problem together, we get more done together. Um, and so I think where there, sometimes where there is a, uh, I guess you say the misconception comes from the idea that um, just because I'm black, I'm being treated a certain way. Um, and sometimes it's easy to confuse 
an officer that's unprofessional with an officer that is racist. Um, and I think that just comes from how we kind of define scenarios and situations. Um, the truth, truth be told, though, at the end of the day, there are racist police officers. There are officers that don't care where you came from. There are officers that don't care about 400 years ago. There are officers that are racially insensitive. Um, there are officers that are extremely biased. There are officers with ego problems, with God complexes. This is true. And they're operating on the same way they operate in our community. They're also operating in, in other communities as well. Um, the question is, um, how do you get rid of them, right? Like, I think that's the real issue. And again, it's not to take away or dismiss the racial component because it exists. I think sometimes we give it more power than it actually is. Um, and sometimes us as a community, we can confuse uh, unprofessional police officer with an officer that's racist simply because of the dialogue or the behavior. And it's like, hold on, I've seen him talk to a white person the same way. Um, so what makes it different? The way it makes us feel. Um, I noticed that when we are disrespected or insulted or when we think a white person's unprofessional, we're quick within our community to call, it, call them a racist. Um, and so sometimes you know, I think we can kind of get a little carried away with it. Hmm. How would you make the distinction? I think it's difficult. To be quite honest, it's difficult um, because you would have to, racism can, can, it can show itself in a lot of different ways. Um, but the reason why I can say with confidence that not every situation is racist because I could look at an officer and see that consistent pattern no matter who they talk to, no matter who they are encountering, or no matter who they arrest. So when I started analyzing, I'm like, man, this guy's just an asshole. Like, it doesn't matter who you are, right? He's just, that's how, he talks to the old lady the same way he talked to this young black kid. The, the reality is we don't need officers like that in the profession. So one of the things I always talk to people about is I start describing like, the dynamics of policing. And I look at it like this. I have witnessed officers disrespect an old lady, an old white man, uh, a black man, a black teen. I've seen them treat them all the same way. The reality is those type of people don't need to be in the profession. And again, and it's not excusing and suggesting that there aren't racist officers. I'm not saying that because there are, right? But if you sit there and you focus so much on race about everything, then you miss all the other variables that make up a bad officer and you don't address it. So you're so focused on trying to find the racist cop that you miss the cop that has an ego problem. You miss the cop that has a power issue. You miss the cop that is there to, to use excessive force on citizens. Just as You miss all these other um, variables that are needed to clean out the profession. A racist cop isn't the only problem, um, and I would even argue it's not necessarily the biggest problem. Um, and it's hard to, a lot of people want to say, okay, this situation is uh, racist, or there's a problem or a dynamic here that um, racism is the component. And you ask, okay, well, how do you know the difference? It is hard to tell sometimes if you're in the wrong, right? So if I'm a citizen, I'm a black citizen, and I committed a crime, then you have an officer who's white who comes into the mix and that officer is rude or he's disrespectful, he's a little more rough with you, we automatically go to the, the, the place of, oh, well, this has to be, he has to be a racist cop. Well, you lose the argument, right? When you're already in the wrong, you've committed a crime and this officer is obligated to address you. You might not like the way the officer addressed you. You might not agree with how he did it, but him doing that doesn't technically make him a racist, could make him unprofessional. It could make him insensitive. Um, he could say, you know, unless he says something, obviously that's a verbal race, like a racial statement, a racist statement, that's different. Um, but whether he does or doesn't make a racist statement is not even a way to indicate whether or not he's racist either. Because again, when you're talking about a racist person, you're dealing with what's in their heart, what's in their mind. And if they don't show anything, you not liking how you're treated is not going to be a strong enough argument. You need more, in my personal opinion. So I think the safest, the best way to remove that element is to take out and punish those who are unprofessional. Because regardless, at the end of the day, as an officer, whether you, th you don't like me because of my color or my skin, 
or or whatever it is or my ethnicity or my religious whatever the back issue is that you have with me the punishment of abusing or disrespecting or insulting or being unprofessional will force you to respect me regardless how you feel and i think that as long as we hold officers accountable when they're unprofessional when they break the law when they use excessive force then whatever you are, whatever you think you are, whether I believe it to be true or not, it doesn't matter because I can wipe you out of the profession regardless, simply because of your behavior. And I think that's my argument a lot of times when I have these conversations is focus on the behavior. Don't focus on the skin color. Because if you focus on the skin color, there's a good chance you might be wrong. And just because an officer is white and they said something you didn't like doesn't make them a racist. Hmm. What is the... I guess police position or the police uh, philosophy on how criminals are created. <laughs> I believe. Um, I think everybody's different on what they think how how criminals are created. Um, one of the most consistent consensus I think is the home parenting. Okay. Um, that's the most repeated statement. Uh, you know, the parents allow their kids to do this. If you raise your kid better. You know, there's a saying we say, if you don't raise them, we'll cage them, Hmm. you know. And so a lot of officers, every officer that I remember speaking to about just criminality, they always talk about the home. They always say the home is the problem, you know. Um, And so I would I would agree with that. I think a lot of officers are very surface level. Right. They don't get into the minutia of everything as far as like, okay, well, you have a lack of resources or you have poverty. You know, um, they do say discipline as well, um, because we'll we'll deal with juveniles, as you can imagine, under underage kids roaming the streets after midnight. They're like, what are the parents doing? You have no control of your kids. You know, so I think we look at it from a parenting standpoint. Um, I don't think we take it any further than that. Yeah, we don't. And at the same time, we don't have any control over it. You know, a lot of people don't realize that law enforcement, we are, we're a cleaning agent. You know, we're not a curing agent. Our job isn't to, to we, we show up after the fact, right? We're, we're reactive. We're not necessarily proactive. Um, and so we don't necessarily always prevent crimes. We're there to clean up mess, you know? Um, One of the things that I've heard that's actually a, a good argument. They say that, you know, police officers are tasked with five different jobs, right? right. Just like firefighters have to get cats out of the tree. Police officers have to show up if somebody's having a mental breakdown. Correct. What are some resources that should be made available to offload some responsibility from police officers and stop certain situations that could be handled right. through a psychiatry or psychology and it's handled by some police officer with an ego problem or whatever the case may be, and he goes to his pistol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, listen, I think um, there's a lot of jobs that we do in this profession that we don't want to do, and any officer will tell you that. A lot of officers really just want to deal with violent criminals, right? Like, we want to hunt down criminals, um, take them off the street. Like, it's clear who the bad guy is, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Point him out, yeah. What happens is uh, we are dealing with a, a plethora of issues that we're not trained to do we might go we might get coached I always say we're coached to do this we're not trained you know training is a very strong word when you say training coaching is easy hey do better next time hey this is how you do that right it's it's a very brief overview and some of the situations we're dealing with are so dynamic that you have to be trained properly on it we're talking policing itself should be a, like a three year training profession to where you come out and you're skilled you're skilled at the job there needs to be social programs right where they handle I would say 90% Mm. of the the calls and situations that police are dispatched to we shouldn't be dispatched to 90% Mm. so you're talking about 90% of the 911 calls police shouldn't really be dealing with, then you're like, well, damn, then who should be dealing with them? Right. You know, the reality is this, a lot of things are offloaded on the police department. We are, we are society's dumping ground for problems. 
social issues, mental health issues, domestic, relationship, family, children, father figure, father figure, mother figure, big brother, big sister. Like we are here to replace bad homes, bad parenting, correct? Like that, we're not, a lot of us aren't built, designed for that. Majority didn't sign up for that. Um, you need programs in place. The problem is this, is, and I noticed, I, I recognize this after dealing with DFACS, um, Department of Family Children Services. Um, I know every state calls it different, but even their workers don't get paid enough. Mm -hmm. They don't get paid enough. They don't like dealing with a lot of the issues that they deal with. Their heart's not in it. Yeah. Um, they are, uh, they're exhausted from the job. The job is draining, it's stressful. They get off at a certain time, right? Police, we're 24 hours nonstop. So instead of DFACS handling, who do they call? They call the police, right? Um, instead of other social programs handling these family issues, domestic issues, they call the police. Mental health, they call the police. Um, we're not trained. We're absolutely, we're not even trained to do the job we're supposed to do well enough. Mm. So can you imagine? Our job, carry gun, shoot bad guys. Some of us can't even do that properly. Some of us can't even take a punch in the face without pulling the gun out. So now you want me to come over here and, and deal with this family's domestic issue? You know, so my primary function, I'm not even good at. So now you have me doing all these sub functions. I can't even do my primary job. I don't even know the law good enough. That's my primary job is the law. And I can't even, and I'm violating people's law rights every day. And so now you want me to juggle these kids out here in this? So it's too much. So I was talking to a friend of mine about it. And I said, you know, what should happen is there should be a, you know, these cities, these counties, they need to develop a, a unit where their responsibility is to um, handle the social issues, take that burden off of law enforcement. And what will end up happening is you will free up the officer's time. You will reduce the burnout that officers get. Officers will respond to violent uh, situations. That's really what we need to be responding to. Uh, serious threats, threats and acts of violence, and of course, robberies. And I would say respond to only the seven deadly sins. I think that's what law enforcement should be for, respond to the seven deadly sins. That would free up their time to train more consistently. Um, it'll free up their, their, their time uh, of rest and break to produce, reduce the burnout within the police department. Uh, and then what will happen is all those other calls of service are handled by professionals in that area, in that expertise. Um, and if an officer is needed for, um, I guess, safety concerns and things like that, then after that situation has been evaluated, then the police come out. This is similar to like if you have someone sitting in the car and they're intoxicated. Well, instead of calling the police, guess what? You call this social service unit that goes and says, hey, listen, we're going to give you a ride. Listen, we're not going to call the police. No citation. We'll take care of it. We'll drive you home, right? There's no need for that citizen to feel in fear for their safety or in fear of going back to jail or getting a ticket. Now, granted, uh, it doesn't mean we want to coddle citizens so when they are encountering the police that they don't obey the law, not saying that. What we are saying is if we can reduce any unnecessary interaction with the police and if it can create a healthy outcome, then why not? Right. And so you send police in in situations that require a gun and require some type of physical action to remove a person or to detain or restrain somebody. Outside of that, all those things should be done um, by another different service group. That's, I think, even traffic stops as well. I think vehicle accidents as well. I don't think those should be handled by police unless there is suspicion of maybe DUI or suspicious of maybe some illegal activity. I think there should be another separate unit that goes out there and handles that should be a social service call and not, you know, you're talking about sending in, it's equivalent to like sending in like a little military. When you call the police, you're sending in a little military. That's how I always look at it. Um, and that's how we're designed to look at problems with force. So, and not every, not every officer is good at distinguishing when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate to use levels of force, so. Should it be harder to become a police officer? Absolutely. It should be. And, and I, I, I wanna preface that by saying, is there enough of a demand or enough of a, not a demand, 
a funnel of people who are actively trying to become police officers or are you guys struggling to recruit? Um, all of the above. So struggling to recruit for obvious reasons, the pay, the resentment, the, the danger. Yeah. Um, then you have, then you have a situation too where, um, uh, okay, nobody's interested in doing the job and those who are interested might not be qualified to even do the job. So now you have to constantly lower standards to get closer to the bottom of the barrel mm. in order, in hopes that they will, you can train them up within three to four months to do this job. Policing should be by far one of the most difficult professions to get into. The FBI won't allow you to get in to their or any federal job within with, without at least a three to four year background and application process. So if the federal government requires their applicants to, to go through this three to four year process, in policing you can essentially get the same power as the federal government. They, they enforce federal laws, you, you enforce state and local laws, you get the job within three to four months of training. You know, and so the problem is police training should be at least three, three years, at least two to three years. Before you're out on the street or? Yep, before you're out wow. on the street, mm. before you're out on the street. At least three years, and I think um, some of that should be college, and then of course a lot of that should be just constant repetition um, and training. And that training should extend after and outside of graduation out of the academy. I think training should consist consistently. Um, right now, they don't have a weight requirement. You can turn into a fat ass in this profession and still keep your job. Um, I remember when at my department, they tried to give bonuses to those who were able to maintain the PT standards that got you in the job. And those who can actually do it every year annually, you got a bonus. They're trying to incentivize officers to lose weight, stay in shape. Well, of course, all the fat officers got mad because they could not do the PT exam at their current weight size and condition that they were in. And so because they weren't getting their raises, they threatened to sue the police department. And of course, since they were going to win, guess what? They had to disman uh, dismantle that idea. What's the problem with that? You know, there's, there's no incentive to stay in shape. There's no incentive to be a better officer. Once you get in, you're in, you're squared away. Um, and so that within itself is a problem. Yeah. Officers don't have to become better. Um, you can stay stagnant, you can stay uh, subpar, and you'll still get paid the same way. This, is, this, uh, this veteran officer told me this one day, I got into this high-speed chase and shooting, and it just, it just got real crazy. And ultimately, what he ended up telling me, because I was kind of, I was kind of feeling pretty down about the situation, how it turned out. And uh, he said, Nathan, you know, you're always trying to catch everybody. You know, you're working hard, you're catching everybody. He said, but at the end of the day, you know, sometimes you might lose somebody. And I said, that's true. I said, but not on my watch, right? He said, listen, the same money they pay you to catch that ass is the same money they pay you to watch that ass get away. And when he said that, I'm like, man, you lazy bastard, right? <laughs> like, I'm listening to him because at the time, I'm a young rookie guy. I'm yeah. like, if I see a criminal, catch a criminal, whatever. Um, but him saying that really put it in context of how some officers think. That whether I catch you, and what he was trying to say is, it's okay if you miss them, you can catch them tomorrow. You know, your money's not going to change either way. That wasn't my mentality, you know. Um, my mentality was, I have someone who's trying to get away. You know, what if he is a... What if he's wanted for kidnapping? What if he's wanted for rape? What if he's wanted for murder? And I didn't try hard enough to catch him. Then I got to look his victim or his family in the face of the family of the victim and say, hey, I didn't, I didn't try hard enough and they got away. And that was always my greatest fear. So I think that one of the biggest challenges is finding quality officers, paying quality officers, training quality officers, maintaining quality officers. And the way we do it now, there's absolutely no way this thing is gonna continue to work. Um, the reason why we have these bad outcomes with officers, and, and granted, and I will say, the majority of outcomes are good, just from the sheer numbers, if you just look at the data, you know, the amount of, you know, we're talking about on average, 10, 10 million people are being arrested, you know, annually. Um, and out of that, those being arrested, you only have approximately 1,200 people who are shot and killed during a police encounter. So one would argue the officers are doing a good job, right, as far as that's concerned, number-wise. 
But again, people are having other issues with police in reference to not feeling like they are they could be trusted, that they're professional, that they're abusing their power and authority and things like that. And those are things that have to be addressed. Um, and regardless of how the numbers look, you know, our job is to service the people. And if the people don't feel like our service is adequate, then it's on us to fix it. What can uh, citizens do better um, to not just police the police, but also contribute to better outcomes with the police? Because we've talked about what police can do better, better training, better equipment, better, um, you know, a longer period before you can even wear a badge. Right. What can citizens do better? And also talk about some of the psychology of a police officer mm. so we can get a glimpse into what you're thinking when you pull me over, what you're thinking when you stop me or when I fit the description. Um, honestly, the best thing, the best thing a citizen can do is be properly informed um, and not allow uh, the media to educate them on, on, on certain situations. Yeah. Uh, take the time to listen. You know, understand that there are officers that are unprofessional. Understand that they are some that are that are rude, have egos. Um, my thing I tell people all the time: be patient. Just be patient. Uh, don't try to hold court on the side of the street. Um, you know, document, record if you have some issues, and report it accordingly. You know, and so that way you can address your concerns. It's very hard sometimes to win an argument with an officer on the street. So I always tell people, just be patient. Understand that sometimes you never know what this officer went through before they got to you, or what type of lifestyle that officer lives. And it's not to make an excuse, but more so to just try to be understanding. Um, you never know what type of officer you're going to get. So. Being courteous, being respectful goes a long way. I think that's kind of like the best advice I always give citizens. And never, never resist. You know, don't resist arrest. Try to cooperate as much as possible. Um, and even if you're being insulted or disrespected, I know it's difficult to say, but sometimes uh, just be patient. Document everything. Record if you can. Um, but don't try to fight or, or challenge an officer in that moment because it doesn't end well. And I think... As a citizen, knowing your rights is very important. Um, and if you feel like your rights have been violated, always consult with an attorney. Um, but just try to be try to try to put yourself in the shoes of an officer and understand what we go through and what we have to deal with. Take the time um, and ask questions. And sometimes, honestly, just saying thank you for your service when you see an officer, it goes a long way. It feels good. Um, smiling. Even I know sometimes you might not like a particular officer. Remember, all officers are not created equal. We're all different people. We're all different people wearing a uniform. Um, try to see the person in the uniform before seeing the uniform. Um, and just the same way I tell citizens, you don't like to be profiled or judged. Officers, we don't like that either. Even when I was out of uniform and I would get pulled over, I always wanted to see how I was gonna be treated um, just as a citizen. And so, um, but because I know the job and the psychosis behind being an officer, I understand how we think as well, which is why I'm able to say, listen, sometimes try to get to know that individual person. Don't treat that officer like the bad officer who treated you bad in that last encounter that you may have had. Um, don't punish that officer from your past experience with someone, that person's a stranger. This is somebody new. Um, let that officer give you an opportunity to see who they are um, and build a new rapport with that new encounter and let that speak for that moment and not something that happened in the past with somebody else. Um, so the mentality of an officer. <laughs> what I say is that The difference between a, a Christian, Muslim, an atheist, a homosexual, a pedophile, a person of integrity, person with pride, courageous, brave person, or a person that's trash, piece of shit, what do they all have in common? They all wear a police uniform. And that's how diverse policing is. And that's the truth. You have one of everybody in this profession. 
So it's not a consistent thing where, you know, you're going to find a little bit of everybody. Why? They're, they're, you're, you're pulling these people from society. So, you know, I knew an officer who was an atheist, who knew an officer who believed in, who practiced Satanism. I'm like, how'd you get the job? I was like, well, that's his religion, right? Can't discriminate against religions. So, so who's to say a Christian officer is better than a, an atheist officer or an officer that's a Muslim? It's, it's the character, it's the behavior, it's the integrity. You don't know what you're going to get. And, and that's why it's more important to judge officers by their behavior than it is to judge them by who you think they are because you might get it wrong but their behavior will always tell you who they are. Um, and then when the behavior is addressed, ad adjust, addressed, when the behavior is addressed, you can actually examine that. The, the, the mind of an officer is interesting because we approach situations always concerned about our safety, always concerned about whether or not we are going to go home at night, right? That you hear officers say that all the time, and then your citizens will be like, well, we want to go home too, which is true. Unfortunately for you, the law supports us protecting ourselves over the citizen self, right? Meaning that if you put an officer in an uncomfortable position, if you put the officer in a position where they fear for their safety or their life, they have a right to protect themselves above all, um, which is why I always tell citizens, you know, comply to survive. Yeah. So... So I always say, you know, that's the reason why we always make those statements that it's better to comply to survive. Yeah. Um, the mentality of an officer is about, about safety. It's always about safety. It's always about survival. So, you know, that can create a fear response, too, with officers. <clears throat> so it's always important. People say, hey, when you're doing this, you know, don't fidget around. Don't put your hands in your pockets. Don't, you know, make sure you cut the lights on in your car. You want to make the officer as comfortable as possible. Um, because you don't want the officer to be uncomfortable, be fearful. And people say, well, you're in a job where fear is an element. You shouldn't be so scary. Well, that's true. You shouldn't. But we're human, right? Um, and so when we talk about what officers are thinking about, a lot of times we're always trying to see um, what's the safest way to do a dangerous job. Um, and, and that's kind of usually what goes on in our mind. What's your response to defund the police? Um, first of all, explain how you understand it as an officer, and then second of all, what is a what does that word look like in your opinion? The way I'll tell you how it was marketed. It was marketed as we're going to um, defund, like dismantle, um, reduce funding uh, to the police. Um, that's how it was marketed because I remember when it came out um, and then I know they politicized it a lot uh, but the whole idea was we want to see what life looks like without police uh, some city said what life would look like with police with no guns or police that don't do traffic stops so every every city there are a couple major cities that looked at it differently some people said we want the police out of the community we don't want them policing uh, we had that here in Atlanta, where the city of Atlanta was, was the, that defund narrative was so strong that the police decided not to respond to 911 calls anymore. Um, so what is it supposed to be about? What they started to say after they cleaned up the message was we want to reallocate resources, that we're investing way too much money into police, um, and that money needs to be addressed in other areas like these social programs that we talked about earlier. Which I agree, these you know money needs to be re reallocated, but actually, we actually need to refund the police. We actually need to put more money into policing. The problem is money's not being placed in the right places to have the best outcomes that we need. Um, and so that's where we're having these issues. If you want better trained officers, if you want better outcome, if you want um, more high tech equipment that that can uh, save lives without using lethal um, methods like a gun. You have to pay more money. To train officers more and better, you have to pay more money to, to train them longer. If you want higher quality applicants, you have to pay them more. So, so if you want better, you have to invest better. Um, and, so, and if you invest better, you end up ultimately end up uh, saving more 
because the better trained and equipped the officers are, you're going to reduce the lawsuits. And as you know, there are some cities that, are, that have paid out millions of dollars. And nationwide, you're talking billions of dollars with the lawsuits. So you get to reduce those, those losses from a tax person's perspective as well, from a taxpayer perspective. Um, so defund the, the police is, it was a very, very bad idea. It was a very bad slogan. Um, I understood what they were trying to do, but it didn't work. Um, and it was extremely bad marketing, in my personal opinion. Uh, I think it's true that you need to fund social programs, but they don't even know what programs need to be funded. Um, you need to do something about policing and the police budget, but they don't know what to do. And that's the issue. The, they're not taking advice um, from people who have good ideas. They're not taking advice from people in the profession. And sometimes some of the biggest people in the profession who are given the advice have been bought out. So they don't, they have a, a bias interest, right? More so leaning towards their relationship with maybe um, like a police union. And so when you have that corrupt interest, then guess what? You're not gonna really put the interest of the people before, uh, before yourself. And like anything in this country, that's our biggest issue. Someone's always in somebody's pocket. And then the real people who get hurt are the citizens and we don't get any outcomes at all. If you think about all that went on with defund the police, with Black Lives Matter, there have been no tangible policies created that suggest there's any type of reform or change that occurred that would reduce any type of problems that people were suggesting they have with police. There's been nothing. And so then what was all that for? Mm. I've heard from a lot of um, black people that uh, black police officers are the worst. <laughs> Almost like they have a, a, a chip on their shoulder. They need yep. to prove something. They need to, they go extra hard, right, yeah. to convince maybe their white counterparts that, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be just as fair and just as, you know, police gung-ho as you are. Is there any truth to that? Or, or how would you, I guess, help us understand that better? Yeah, man, that's like a myth. That's a myth. I think, um, um, Again, it's people who see everything with color. Um, people are still trying to attach police behaviors 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago to today. It's not to say that there's not going to be that one black officer and that one white officer that are like trying to impress each other. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the difference between the exception and the rule. And I think a lot of times we see one. I've had someone tell me that all oh, he was acting like this until the white officer showed up. But then they don't realize that the, that white officer was the one in charge, right? They don't understand the dynamics, right, where whoever pulls you over is the one responsible for that interaction. Everybody else is support. So you don't get the final say, you don't get the decision. So if I am the, a white officer and I pull you over, I'm in control of everything that happens. I make the final decision. I come second. Now the second person, the black officer, shows up. Now here I go showing up, black officer. Now you see the white officer talking to me crazy. I'm the black officer. I don't have any power over that. Unless he's violating the law or abuse or whatever. But as far as the decision, so now what you see, your perception, is that you see a white officer being mean to me, being rude. And you see a black officer just standing there not saying nothing. So to you, you're like, ah, oh, you know, this is that old. Sell out, yeah. yeah, he got to sit here and he doing what the white man telling him to do. And it's not like that at all. Actually, that officer has nothing to do. And a lot of times might not even outrank him by seniority. So there have been situations where I've showed up and there was a black officer that was primary. We call it primary and secondary. Primary is in charge of everything. The primary officer is black. I show up. He's doing stuff that doesn't that looks stupid to me or whatever, and I think he's doing the most. I, I outrank him out of seniority, so I have the power to go over there and tell him to sit down and chill out, right? And so I show up, secondary officer, the primary officer is white. He's doing something crazy that I don't like, I don't agree with. I have the power and authority to tell him to chill out. Um, I've done it. We do it. Black officers check white officers and vice versa all the time. Now, granted, people would say, well, maybe that, that's not the same, maybe in some rural podunk town, South Georgia, Alabama. Okay, po yeah, possibility, that's true. 
But those are exceptions. Those aren't the rule. And I think I've seen people say, you know, why, why does it take these four officers to show up, four white officers and one black officer, and he's sitting here doing this, and the black officer show up, now he's showing out. Well, then I would hear these things, and I would ask him what the scenario is. I'm like, oh, okay, that's what it is. The problem is some black people are trained to see everything through racism. Um, and sometimes it's just not there. But we can force ourselves to see it that way because we don't like what we see. But not understanding what's actually taking place um, it doesn't mean it is racist. It just means you just don't understand. Um, but, but what I will say is um, you asked, uh, what was the other question you asked with that? It was kind of. Uh, basically, uh, black officers doing the most and they're trying to prove something to their white counterparts that they're fair and the whole nine. Yeah, so that's, that's not a thing. I think people, what they have to realize is there's a, there's a actual family bond between officers a lot of times, black, white, Asian, and Hispanic. And a lot of times you have officers that are just rude. They're just assholes. They have egos. And there's a shared ego relationship between these officers. Whereas one officer, though he's black and this officer's white, they align with the same views on how to police. So what, what's happening is you're having two like-minded people working together who believe that this is an appropriate way to police the citizenry. And so in your mind, you see color. Well, I've worked with these officers. What I see is brotherhood. I see camaraderie, right? I see we're, we're partners. We're actually partners. We ride together. So we've established a bond. And so we act the same way. Um, <clears throat> you have some officers where they just have an ego problem. And sometimes their ego is so bad that it does translate into mistreatment. Uh, and that's not okay. But again, um, I've witnessed it uh, because I've witnessed them treat a white person the exact same way with the same attitude, the same disrespect, or the same ego. Um, I've seen them do it consistently across the board. Uh, but again, that's not to negate or take away. Um, people say black officers, and this is something I have witnessed, and this is something I always talk about. I was like, I've seen black officers treat black people worse than white officers. Just like when women say, I've seen women officers treat women worse than they see men treat. I don't know what that's about. Now, what I will say is, um, anytime I talk to people a lot of times about this, and I say, well, well have you ever been stopped by a white officer? And, you know, even today, you know, we spoke to, you know, Russell, he's a young white male, and he talked about his experience with, with white police officers. And he talked about the same thing that we talk about on our side of the fence in reference to professionalism and how he was profiled, right? He was profiled based on how he looked. Um, he was profiled based on his age. Uh, and he profiled him because he was white. He thought he was a drug, like he was going to have drugs on him. So, so, but these are stories that we don't hear in the black community because we think it doesn't necessarily happen, quote unquote. We don't think white people are harassed uh, and profiled because they look a certain way. And it's not to take away from our experience, but, but I always like to highlight that to show that it, it's not just us and that it is a problem over here as well. Um, and so I think that, I don't know, I blame it on ego. Some people like to say it's uh, black folks wanting to be, you know, they've been brainwashed and to be white supremacist soldiers. And no, that's when I say that's so far from the truth. Sometimes you guys, it's just as simple as saying this guy's an asshole. He's a dick. You know, he, he really wants to be more than who he is. And I think it has everything to do with power, has nothing to do with skin color. I think people get so caught up in skin color, but let me tell you this. This is the only profession that I know of where you don't have to earn somebody's respect to be respected, right? So could you imagine, you don't have to be a respectable person in order to demand and command to be respected. So I simply have to put this uniform on. Even though I'm not a respectable person, you have to respect me simply because I have the uniform on. Listen, I think people don't understand how powerful that is. What does that do to somebody 
who never took the time to be one, a respectable person, an honorable person, a person with integrity. But simply because I wear this uniform, you have to respect me. You have to submit to me in public. If I tell you to do something, you have to do it. If you touch me, I have to make an example out of you. If you don't listen to my commands, I have to make an example out of you. Now, mind you, I may have never threw a punch in my life. I may have never had to do anything that was courageous or brave. But because I had the uniform on, you acknowledge me as a brave person. You acknowledge me as a courageous person. You acknowledge me as a person with integrity, though I've never did anything worth being respected or had ever had any integrity in my entire life. The uniform grants you that, and you never earned it. That's the problem with the profession. That's why it's not about skin color, it's about power. You have people in this profession that command respect and they're not respectable people. Before they put the uniform on, they weren't anybody that should have been respected in the first place. But the profession requires that you respect them. That's the issue. That has to be fixed. You fix that, you fix 80% of the problem in law enforcement. That piece right there has to be fixed, you know? And so that's the challenge. We've seen this with the, uh, that was a sociology experiment with the prison. Yeah. Right? And they put these people in, they put these in this- uh, The Stanford prison The Stanford prison experiment. And what did it show you? It showed you that- Corrupted. There you go. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Everybody was not meant to wield power and they don't teach you how to wield power they give you power and they don't tell you its effects they don't tell you how it can be abused and they don't tell you how corrosive it is self-corrosive it is there are times I used to look in the mirror and I had to check myself you know um and so when you have people who don't do that introspective work When I ask somebody to do something, they have to do it, regardless of how they feel. You have to comply with what I say, or I have to make you. I always had a philosophy, I called it the ATM method. Ask, tell, and make in that order. I don't deviate. If I ask you, you don't do it, I'm gonna tell you. If you don't do it, I have to make you. That's the job. A lot of people don't realize, but that is the job. I can't sit here and argue with you. If you're under arrest, you're under arrest. You don't want to go to jail, then guess what? I have to make you. The first time I had a situation, a guy told me he just got done beating the mess out of his girlfriend, her eyes purple, closed up, ribs purple, shattered her ribs, I think even broke her jaw, lacerated her lips. We showed up. He just got out of prison. He looked at me and said he's not going back to jail. All right? I'm only two years in the job. 22-year-old. Young man looking at this grown man. He says, I'm not going back to jail. He said, what you going to do? So I put my gloves on. I said, well, shit, I guess we about to get, we about to get physical. So in that situation, what do you do? I have to make you. I have to put you in handcuffs. I can't ask you nicely. You said you're not going. And you said you're ready to throw down. So what do you do in that situation? I think you have people who aren't built for this. Even I was too young to be doing this job. Should have never, they should never allow anybody under the age of 25 to be a police officer. There's no way. I think my sheer maturity and ability to to self-reflect and my humbleness allowed me to maneuver through this profession. I was able to talk more people in handcuffs than I had to actually put hands on them. Um, and so, but I re- had respect for people. I've had people tell me, hey man, I was gonna reach for that gun, but man, some just told me like, nah, you know. I would, I would pray with people on the way to the jail. You know, I would, I would speak life into them on the way to the jail. I would tell people, hey, you know, you know, this incident doesn't have to define you. You know, I know you robbed that lady. Hey, I know you, 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 know, you did this and did that, you sold these drugs. This doesn't have to define you. You know, and so I had a different approach, but I'm, I'm, there are other officers like me, but we're not all like that. You know what I mean? And so that's a challenge too, finding people with the right heart. 
but but overall, man, there's a, it's a power complex. And if you don't deal and address the power, you don't teach officers how to wield that power, how to understand when that power is overtaking them and what that looks like and check them and, and, and cut that off, you're going to have a problem. They don't teach you how to deal with power. They don't teach any of us how to deal with power. That's why when you see people who finally get money and success, they act crazy. They start losing themselves in the moment. Why? Because now you finally feel powerful first time in your life and you do not know how to handle it. You don't know how to handle it when you can make someone do something that they don't want to do. That's power. You can make up a story. You can fabricate. You can bend the rules. Right? That's power. You have power. You have leverage. That goes, that, that counts for outside the police and inside the police department. You know? Should, uh, should police officers live in the neighborhoods that they police, why or why not? Wow, that's a good question. Um, no, they should not. Mm. Um, I did in my first, in my beginnings, but I stayed across, I lived across the street from a woman who was a prostitute. Her son was a gang member and he would break into homes and break into cars. He knew I lived across from him. And I would see her bring Johns in the house all the time. We had a un, we had a un, we had an understanding and a respect. He knew who I was. I knew who he was. He was gonna do dirt in the neighborhood. He did all his dirt outside. But the, the uncomfortable thing was he knew where I lived at. Mm. Right? He knew. You know, there are nights I would get off from work. I would obviously changed my uniform and keep my gun on me and stuff like that so that people wouldn't know who I am. But eventually people find out. I would have to go to the store. I remember going to like Walmart and Publix. I'd always have to wear disguises, hats and everything like that, wear sunglasses because, you know, you run into these people again. You go to the mall, you run into these same people you dealt with last week. The guy you locked up, his girlfriend, they're out. Before you get off of work, you run into them. You know, I would tell my family, if you see me in my uniform out at out working, don't ever speak to me unless I speak to you first. Um, and so, cause you never know if I'm dealing with somebody, looking for somebody and they see me acknowledge you and then now you become a target. I had to take myself off of social media cause you had suspects who were looking for officers and seeing where their family were and things like that, threatening them, trying to follow them around. Um, and so, no, I don't think, I think if officers live in a community, it has to be secured and gated. It has to be a police compound of sorts to where that's where officers live at. And yes, they do live in the community, but they live in this compound. But the problem is you still have to live and exercise and move around within that area and it's dangerous. Mm. What do you do when a suspect that you arrested, they follow you back home? They find out what car you drive. They find out where you live. There have been officers who've been carjacked. There have been officers who've been robbed. You know, there's, there's all types. There's officers' homes have been broken into, and their equipment and weapons have been stolen. So it is very dangerous. What's the solution? Because a lot of people's argument is if you don't live in the community, then how, do you, how are you attached to the community? Well, you don't have to live there to be attached. My solution, based on um, my reform package that I put together, how do you work around that? When you extend the amount of time officers need to be training, you also need to be sending them into these communities to do community service. Without the uniform, without their gun, there's a certain amount of hours that they need to consistently do, not just in the academy, but also after they graduate. Community service should always be a part of their job, meaning maybe it's one day a week, right? Because now here's how my reform package looks. If, now I told you about, 85% to 90% of the stuff officers are called to do, we shouldn't be well, doing it. Unnecessary, yeah. So if you take all that away, guess what? Now they, these guys got seven days a week wide open to work. Well, one day out of those weeks, every week, one day a week, that officer should be doing mandatory community service training in the community. Whatever that looks like, they need to be there. They need to be bonded and connected to the community that they're serving. That's how you do it, and you do it consistently. It's part of the job. It's not something you did in the academy. It's not something they forced you to do. It's part of the job. Um, that's how you build that relationship. That's how you build that bond. Um, I think 
you cannot serve I think you cannot serve a community if you're not attached or connected to them. You don't have to necessarily live there, but you have to understand, you have to be a part of it. Having officers do community service, even outside of work, we're talking everybody's required. Normally what police officers or police departments do now is they have maybe five officers that are part of a community service unit, and that five, their job is to do, go out there, hand out candies and kiss babies. Well, the other, 99% of the officers are not required to do it. Well, that's a problem. So these five officers are there to give the impression that we are community-based. But those five officers, a lot of times, don't even do police work anymore on, on average. They play the football, and they help. It does help create a positive image. Right. But you need the officers who are doing the job to have those connections. Because just because Officer John has a good rapport with the community doesn't mean Officer Tim, Mike, Scott, you know, Tyrone, Officer Tyrone, Officer Jackson, they need the same rapport as well. Why? Because they're the ones who are going into those communities day in and day out. And they don't know the people. They live an hour away from the community they're serving. They're white and they're patrolling in a black community. You know what you need to do? Just like in school, when we were in high school, white kids sat on this table, Black kids sat on this table, Asians sat on this table. You have to force them to be a part of the community they're serving. Um, people need to see their face, know who they are. They need to understand what's going on. They need to understand the nuance, the struggles. They need to understand what people are going through day and day. They need to, to mingle with the children. They need to have a connection. They need to see themselves in the people that they're serving. And so that is the answer to that problem. Um, Officers would never agree being forced to live in a community because it's a safety issue. These officers have kids, some of them are married. So, so that's why I always say, and we talked about this earlier, people bring out these ideas, but because they didn't do the job, they don't understand why officer will say, no, nah, I don't agree with that. To them, they're like, well, this is a good idea. No, no, it's not a good idea because it's a safety concern. You know, We want to sleep safe at night as well. Um, and so I think that's one of the challenges um, people don't realize. And I think that's why it's so important to have someone like myself or other officers with experience and a creativity. Because outside of being experienced, how creative are you about solving the problem? You have to be able to think outside the box. So, you know, just as simple, I've never heard of making it mandatory for all officers to do community service. And if you're the type of officer that's like, I don't want to do that, then you're not meant to be an officer. Mm. Your job, your call to be a servant of the people. Right. And you cannot serve people that you do not know. And that's just what it is. Mm. What is, um, what's your take on gun control? Or, or <laughs> more specifically, the abundance of guns uh, amongst citizens. Does that make police work harder? Or would you prefer a world where more citizens are armed? I think there's too many guns. I think I prefer a country where citizens have an ability to protect themselves. So I'm pro um, 2A all day. I have no issues with it. I do think people get carried away, but I know that's their personal prerogative, right? So <clears throat> no question there. I have an issue with the irresponsibility of gun owners. A lot of our guns that these criminals have and young adults have, kids have, teenagers have, they have them because they steal them from gun owners, from legal gun owners. So you have illegal gun owners taking legal guns from legal gun owners. Well, that's the problem because they're irresponsible gun owners. I love guns. I think they should have them. Um, I think any form of gun control is kind of, it's, it's, it's not logical 